For longer than there have been people, the same countless array of stars has filled the sky. It's little wonder that for most of our history we believed the stars to be fixed and eternal. But as we know, appearances can be deceiving. We've come to learn that the stars have finite lives, and the heavens continuously form and give birth to new stars to enlighten the night sky. Until recently, relatively recently, meaning of course about 10 years ago in astronomy, most of what we knew about very early star formation was theoretical. Now, because we can study the way the gas behaves that condenses to form stars, we can actually see if these theories are true. On the one hand, we know that stars have formed and we know that stars are held together by gravity. So somewhere between these, these big structures in space and now, or at least when there's a star, gravity takes over and makes the whole thing contract, usually in, in creating a cluster of stars. But there are some severe problems with that when we actually get down to the nitty gritty. Under the veil of darkness, the sky shows no sign of the complex nature of star formation. But it's here, in the darkest parts of the heavens, that the story of stellar birth begins. Hundreds of years ago, quite literally, when some astronomers noticed that in some directions when they looked through telescopes there were these very dark regions between the stars. And the most famous uh, observer of the very early uh, dark regions was William Herschel who called them vacancies in the heavens or holes in the heavens. But it wasn't until uh, Edward Barnard, who was born in Nashville back in 1857, uh, when he became a professional astronomer, he started photographing the heavens uh, with a camera mounted to a telescope. And he used the first photographs of the uh, dark holes between the stars. And he was very puzzled by them, but he'd learned from Herschel's book that these were holes in the heavens. But if they are holes in the heavens, there's a very serious problem implied, because if there's a tunnel between the stars, then, and you see lots of them around you, all those tunnels must be pointed at the Earth. And some astronomers pointed out that that could not be correct. There couldn't be holes in the heavens, there had to be something stopping the starlight. So it isn't an absence of stars, it's our inability to see through the four, it's like having a dark curtain in front of the stars. It's our inability to see the stars that are there. This abs absorbing material is very close to the, our solar system, and so we can't see the stars that lie behind it. We have come to realize that these are certainly not holes. In fact, they're among the most interesting regions, in my viewpoint, within the Milky Way, because they're not empty. They're very full of dust and of gas, and probably they're the nurseries where the youngest stars are forming. Once astronomers realized these were not holes in the heavens, they began to discover what this interstellar medium actually was. The interstellar medium is, as the name suggests, the description of the material between stars. It's interstellar. It's made up of small particles of dust that often come from the envelopes of dying stars and also from gas, which is of course found throughout the galaxy and throughout the universe. The gaseous component of the ISM is predominantly hydrogen, and we have trace elements of uh, the other uh, helium and the heavier elements, but by and large we're talking about a lot of hydrogen out there. We can detect the gas in the interstellar medium directly because we can observe in slightly denser regions the emission from the 21 centimeter line of neutral hydrogen. And this, of course, is the predominant constituent of the interstellar medium. So we can point radio telescopes tuned to 21 centimeters in the direction of where we believe there are denser regions, shall we say, concentrations of interstellar medium gas. And we can map it out by mapping out where we see this line of 21 centimeter hydrogen. The gaseous component of the interstellar medium uh, ranges in density from the 
uh, the inner cloud medium, which is not very dense, and uh, typically one atom per cubic centimeter, to the much more dense regions in molecular clouds where you, you have gas and dust mixed. To give you a comparison, the one atom per cubic centimeter is about 10 to the 19 times uh, less dense than what we have at Earth's atmosphere. Because there's a great deal of gas and dust, a great many things can happen to it. Therefore, if the light from a young star, which is embedded in these enormous clouds of gas and dust, uh, impinges, the radiation impinges on these dense uh, clouds of hydrogen, in fact, it ionizes them, and as a result, it produces what is called an H2 region, and that's what we see, for example, in the direction of Orion, when we see the glowing clouds of gas and dust. The dust component of the interstellar medium by volume is actually quite small. I guess we'd say about 1% of uh, the mass is locked up in the dust component. Uh, but this is still a very important component because it reveals so much of the chemistry that is occurring. The dust is more like the graphite in your pencils or the silicate on, that you might find on the beach. Gritty stuff. It's nothing that you would call the dust that you sweep off your counters. We can tell this because if we look at the radiation from this dust itself at various wavelengths, we can see characteristic patterns that result from the fact that these silicates or graphite particles are actually known to be the constituents of the dust. The dust has the property, has two properties. One that it makes uh, if it's very thick, it can make stars behind it invisible. If it's thin, thinly distributed, it only partially obscures the stars, and it does what we call redden them. It makes them look fainter, and it makes them look redder, so that we tend to think that these stars must be cooler because they're redder. But in fact, the scattering by the dust particles causes the reddening. It's the same as you experience when you watch a sunset on a clear day, as it approaches the horizon, it gets redder and redder. That is because the light from the sun is actually being scattered off particles in the atmosphere. The blue light gets, bounces off the particles, the dust particles. The red light comes through to your eyes. So the sun looks redder than it normally does. The particles of dust that are doing the obscuration are very small. They are so small that uh, you could think of them in terms of the particles in cigarette smoke. They are in such abundance that when they're all lined up between us and the star that they're obscuring, they will absorb a lot of the light from the star and we can infer their presence by this absorption. Dust can sometimes be seen as blue reflection nebulae, reflecting the light of nearby stars. Such dust plays a key role in changing the composition of the interstellar medium. We now know that molecules form because of the presence of dust in interstellar space. Dust is a catalyst on which two hydrogen atoms can come together and form a molecule and from molecular hydrogen all sorts of other chemical reactions can take place producing other molecules. For a long time the existence of molecules in space was doubted because of the harsh environment. It seemed unlikely that they, they could exist. We now know that they are definitely present because we see such clear indications through the radio observations and the near-infrared now. There's no longer any doubt that there are molecules in space. These molecules are, there are at least 80 species that have already been identified. A large fraction of them contain carbon, which is very important because carbon is the basis of life. It's what we call organic chemistry. Human life is based on organic chemistry. All life on Earth is based on organic chemistry. Now we find lots of these molecules between the stars. While the voids of space contain far more than astronomers once imagined, the dust, gas, and molecules that make up the interstellar medium hold even deeper, more marvelous secrets.
It's not by coincidence that these vast interstellar clouds contain the very same elements as young stars. For astronomers have learned that in the womb of interstellar matter, stars are born. I think the most important and interesting problem is how do you actually get from interstellar matter to a star? We know that sometime before the star forms you have a collapsing cloud, but it's not obvious how you get from interstellar matter, which is highly filamentary. In fact, I don't even think there are too many real clouds in this early, in this sort of general stage of the interstellar medium. How do you get from filaments to stars? The birth of stars takes place in dark interstellar clouds that are shielded from the light of other stars and from galactic cosmic rays, agents which might heat the cloud and prevent it from beginning collapse to form gravitationally bound stars. So in some ways, the life of a star begins in darkness. The requirement for star formation to occur seems to be a certain density and uh, as well as the composition that's available. Just any dark cloud uh, may not be able to form stars because uh, perhaps it's not dense enough or material hasn't coalesced into the proper amount that is required for star formation to occur. The material that makes these vast clouds when you estimate how much matter they contain and you can see how fast they're moving, you can actually do a simple mathematical equation which, which um, relates the force of gravity pulling inwards and the motion blowing apart and you find out that none of those structures have enough mass to form stars. Stars, in fact, could form from any cloud of gas and dust as long as the, a certain few conditions were met. And these conditions are that there be clumps that are cold and that are dense and that some other event will trigger these clumps to become more and more dense and to condense out. Star formation is generally thought to be triggered by some kind of external event. At least the formation of massive stars appear to be, and that's if you study groups of very large stars called OB associations. These appear to form either as the result of perhaps excessive pressure because of the passage of a shock wave after a supernova explosion, or when something called a density wave actually passes through the whole of our galaxy, causing star formation to occur, not just in one place, but in a whole arm of a galaxy. When a unit of molecular cloud material begins to collapse, following kinds of events happen, we think. The parts of that material which aren't spinning very rapidly collapse to form the seed of a new star. The star begins to collapse, deriving most of its energy from release of gravitational potential energy. Gravitational potential energy is turned into heat and eventually the luminosity which we observe at optical and at infrared wavelengths. Eventually, the star collapses to a point where the central temperature, temperature at the very center of the star, reaches a point which is high enough begin nuclear burning, that is, uh, in some cases, taking four hydrogen atoms and turning them into a, helium, uh, into a helium atom with a consequent release of energy. And it's at that point when the star initiates hydrogen burning when it becomes a stable, non-contracting, main sequence star. And we've been exploring the regions and nearby molecular clouds in which these stars can form and see if we can determine whether stars form as individual stars or whether they form in small groups or even in, in large clusters. And recently we have found by mapping a cloud just south of the Orion Nebula that most of these stars form in small families together in groups on the order of 10 to 50 stars. And occasionally, there's a larger cluster on the order of 100 or 200 stars will form, but most of the stars are formed in these smaller groups that just slowly escape from the place where they were born. The Orion Nebula, uh, the entire Orion region, provides a wonderful grounds for studying star formation 
that is, in a sense, in our own backyard. Because it's so close, uh, 500 light years away, we can see details ongoing in the regions of star formation in Orion that we can only guess at in regions that are much further away. The Orion constellation is supposedly a hunter. It has three lines to form a belt, and hanging from that belt is a dagger, three uh, stars forming the dagger, and the middle one is the great nebula in Orion. And in that nebula is a s cluster of stars, very young, less than a million years old, that is still in the gas cloud in which it was formed, and there are still stars being formed in that cluster. That's a young cluster. In the process of these stars circulating around in a sort of random pattern throughout this cluster, uh, they pick up companions in a strictly gravitational way, just like Newton would expect. Uh, a, two stars come close together and uh, well, perhaps they form a double star system. Uh, it, the, at first, this is a very random thing. Uh, a star will pick up whatever happens to be close by to it as a companion. But these uh, double stars, which are, tend to be temporary as long as the stars are in clusters, are sort of like Hollywood marriages in the sense that they come and go. A star will pick up a companion, and the, those two stars will revolve, revolve around each other for a certain length of time. But then the third star comes along, and like a love triangle, it may break up this happy marriage and uh, take the companion away. And then the primary star will look around and try to find another one. It doesn't consciously do this, but just through gravitation, uh, another companion will come and will pick that up. So if you follow these motions through many, many cycles, the stars pick up companions and they get rid of them and pick up other companions and get rid of them. Whether they will live alone or in pairs, newly forming stars are nurtured in the celestial womb until they reach the main sequence stage of their lives. During this time of development, these protostars show no visible signs of existence. Still, we know they are there. Enshrouded in the darkness of interstellar dust, stars slowly form, hidden from the human eye. It's only in recent years that astronomers have found the means to detect their presence. We can't see dust with the naked eye. We can only see black patches, for example, in the middle of the Milky Way, which often you can see stretching across the sky, especially in August and September and October. In the optical regions, the dust is just too dense and the light does not escape from the, the clouds. And so in order to look at the earliest stages of star formation, we have to look in the light in the near infrared in regions where the instruments are just now becoming available to allow us to do this. So when we talk about the infrared uh, uh, part of the spectrum, we're talking about wavelengths of light which are two to three times that of visible light and photons of energy two to three times lower and lower than that and a longer wavelength than that. In looking at the different regions of the infrared, we're actually sampling the different temperatures that these objects are, are at. And if you want to study the very coldest regions of star formation, you'd want to look in the far infrared or the longer wavelengths. And if you're looking in the near infrared, you're seeing um, the hotter, warmer objects. They're still quite cold by comparison to evolved stars, but they are warmer than these very cold regions that would show up in the far infrared. The protostar emits at uh, ultraviolet wavelengths. This emission is absorbed by dust grains, and when it's re-radiated by these relatively cool dust grains, it emerges at infrared wavelengths. And so it's almost a signpost of what's happening within the cloud in the protostellar region. It's not exactly a direct measurement, but from the intensity of the re-radiated emission, we can find out a great many of the properties, how massive the protostar is, what kind of a star it's likely to be. These can all be discerned from the re-radiated uh, information. Infrared astronomers work at telescopes uh, much like the optical astronomers 
we have um, a very special telescope, and that is the Kuiper Airborne Observatory. It is a telescope built into an airplane, so it affords us the ability to get up above most of the Earth's atmosphere, which is critical for the infrared astronomer. Typically, before a flight series, we will sit down in front of the computer and devise a flight plan that optimizes those objects that are most important to our scientific program. We'll be starting out where it says leg one, uh, leaving from Moffett Field. We'll be flying north, and then we have a long leg as we go down south. This is one of my main target mm -hmm. objects. Okay. And uh, then we move over this way, and we have two more of the main mm -hmm. target objects. And in between, we have standard stars that we'll be looking at. And this gives you the direction of the airplane. The right. telescope is right. always pointed That's to right. the left from, okay. the, from the airplane. So We uh, typically have a team of maybe three or four people that are associated just with the instrument, and then the scientific uh, principal investigator and uh, any other support personnel that we might need. We're going to have a lot of people, so try and keep the chatter to a minimum on the interphone so that the science can take priority and get done. The way an observing flight uh, typically runs is that you have a combination of people that come to it with their own areas of expertise. We will have the instrument developer and the people who run that instrument present, and we will have the computer operators, the telescope operators, and the scientific investigator who will guide the science that is being done on that flight. It is um, a matter of complete teamwork in order for the data to be obtained, and it could not work without the expertise of each one of those individuals. Inside the cavity of the Kuiper Airborne Observatory is a one meter class telescope, and it is a Cassegrain telescope. The size of it was very carefully uh, constrained to fit within that, those dimensions. During the flight, we're able to see the data that's being collected. And while it's uh, not really possible to analyze it thoroughly while you're in flight, you're certainly able to see whether or not you're getting the quality of data that you expected. The types of experiments that we do from the Kuiper range from the near-infrared uh, to the far infrared, and it's dependent on the type of instrument that is available for the particular wavelength region of interest. These wavelength regions are regions that we cannot look at from the ground. So there is complementary information to be gained from the near and far infrared. In the near infrared, you would look at the dust surrounding a very um, young star, and in the far infrared, you might look at a neighboring region that is less evolved. Infrared technology enables us to peer through the veil of obscuring dust. Within what appears as empty space, infrared wavelengths reveal the warm glow of stars in the earliest stages of their lives, a condition that does not last. When a star first forms, it's enshrouded in a, in a cloud, a molecular cloud, and then at some point it manages to clear the cloud and we see the star for the first time. And if it's a solar type star, we call it a Titori star. The significance of that, of course, is that uh, it's our first view, first direct view of star formation in, in progress. The winds in Titori stars are one of the most interesting features of these stars. We uh, see evidence for the winds almost immediately. Uh, people can see that uh, the molecular cloud in which the Titori star is formed starts to flow away from the site of formation long before you can see the star itself. And in fact, we see evidence that these outflows go on all during the time that the star is kind of buried in the cloud. So they probably begin uh, maybe 100,000 years or less after the, the actual collapse to the star uh, begins. When the star first forms, it probably pulls in magnetic field from the interstellar cloud. So it may begin with a field, but then this field would dissipate and it has to generate its own field. So we think that the process of the star generating its own field, which we think is necessary for the wind, uh, begins when the star first begins to burn nuclear material. This is not the hydrogen burning in the star which takes place on the main sequence, but it burns what we call heavy water or deuterium. And this, this can occur at a much lower temperature, and it occurs within the first uh, few hundred thousand years that the star is formed. The other kinds of phenomena that one typically talks about in looking at, at star forming complexes are so-called herbig aro objects. These are manifestations of interactions between the winds which almost must accompany stellar birth in order that stars 
not spin up to a critical velocity so that they lose material at their equators faster than they can gain material. The winds that are emanating from these stars interact with the interstellar meeting medium, shocking the interstellar medium, heating the interstellar medium, and producing a unique in emission line spectrum, which signals the birth process in an indirect way. It was some of these Herbigaro objects which led us first to find the, some of these stars buried deep within the cloud because we saw these objects radiating in just very high excitation emission lines and we had not been able to find the sources of their excitation. I think that was probably one of the most exciting moments, at least that I can remember, back in the, in the mid-70s when we, when we first turned the infrared detectors toward the, the Herbigaro objects and tried to find the, the exciting stars. And I think if, if I had to uh, uh, imagine, we knew that there was, there was something having to do with stellar birth, as did Herbig and, and Aro before us. And so it's sort of a combination of observations of stars and the observation of nearby star forming complexes that are going to give us some sort of deeper understanding of the star formation process as it's occurred over the lifetime in the universe. It's been a journey of a million years or more. From nothing more than the gas and dust of the interstellar medium, the star has been formed by pressure and gravity and born into the maternal arms of the galaxy. <laughs> 